for this journey. And every night he would bring me back around five in the morning and I'd cry and I'd weep. And then the next day he would take me again from two to five. And on one of the journeys into hell, he took me to the belly of hell. And the belly of hell was 17 miles high, three miles around. There was like um, stacked on top of each other till six. And you could see skeletons inside there burning and screaming and crying. And inside this place were souls of witches, warlocks, uh, demonic powers, people that used demonic powers to destroy people. Also, the ones that served idolatry. And they would actually, there was a dirt ledge in front, like four feet around, and Christ would speak and we would run, not run, and we would move up by his power, you know, because God has all power. And we would go from level to level, and Christ would talk to him. And he came to this one man that was burning, he was screaming, he was on his knees. said he was on the earth, he was blind. He's blind in hell. Said he used his handicap to seduce many for witchcraft. I said, how did he do that, Lord? Because I didn't know. He said, Charlie, what he did, he would, uh, he would work curses on them. And he would tell them, and give them money for his handicap and things. And all the time, he's doing his witchcraft on these people, like young people, a lot of young people, he said teenagers and things, and they didn't know because they had compassion on him. And he said, these things are true. He said, he, he did his witchcraft, and the man heard him, and he said, yes, I did, and I heard the gospel many times, but rejected you. He said, I never understood the sorrows of hell. He said, I served the devil on the earth, and when I died, this has been my torment. I've been here for years and years, wishing I had listened to the gospel. Wishing I had uh, told the truth, wishing, I'm sorry, I've been told the truth so I could escape this place of damnation. So this is what I learned. Even people in the occult, they come to my services. They think they're going to do harm to us. And God turns it around and saves them by many, many. Because they think that they're going to have a kingdom when they go to hell. They don't have a kingdom. The devil says, do you think that I uh, would give you a kingdom, share my kingdom with you? The devil tells them, I hate you as much as Christians. And there they're burning in hell. We're going to talk about uh, witchcraft here a minute. And what I know is only what the Lord has shown me and told me. We were walking around the jail cells that was 17 miles high. And there was a, to my surprise, there was a rocking chair inside this jail cell. And there was a skeleton sitting in here with an old little ragged doll, rocking back and forth, screaming and crying. And Jesus said, she's in great torture and great pain. And he said, I'm going to allow you to see uh, what she was before this happened and what she did. He said, she was a soothsayer for Satan. And this woman is rocking, and all at once her appearance begins to change. Her whole countenance changes. So at first, she had on a beautiful dress. Let me see the dress of a, a, a beautiful woman. Then it changed to another thing. I think she changed into a uh, animal-looking thing, too, one time. And in my book, I talk about it, but she had many forms. And every time that happened to her, she would scream. And Jesus said, she got this power from the devil by killing people. She would get more power. They would drink the blood. And she would get all this power where she could do these things. And he said, uh, she was killed one day. And she came here. And Satan 
lets her be tormented like this over and over and over. And it is a uh, drastic change. And she feels it and she screams in pain. And this happens to her all the time. And she looked at Jesus and she said, can't you help me? Can't you help me? And she reached to the bars and her, it was like fle flesh had burnt into skeletons. And my heart went out to her, and I tell this in many places, and I don't know if it's Spanish, I forget the nationality, it said there truly is a woman of witchcraft in their circles that sits in a rocking chair and works spells and curses and hexes on people. And they, they said it's real. And uh, there was a young man down there, he was 16 years old, and one of the other men saw him, a friend of mine. He saw him, he was assistant pastor of a church, and his family used to be in the mafia. He was uh, a pastor now. And it all in one night, he was asked, there was a man there preaching on hell, does anybody want to see hell? And he kind of laughed and went up and said, yeah, and the man laid hands on him. And he descended into hell immediately, and there was Jesus, and flames, and fires, and pits, and screams of the dead. And he said, we must hurry. I got three people to show you. So he runs and he shows him his uncle. They're running through the fires and hands reaching out to him. And his uncle had a suit on. And he had, someone had come in and shot him at his desk. And he appeared to him with a suit on in the flesh. Some people God allows that to see. And then he burned up in the fires and he said, warn my son of the family not to come here. That hell is real. And he's screaming. He said, I cannot die. And then the Lord said, hurry, we must go the other side. So he went the other side, and there was his other uncle on his other side of the family. And he had died a horrible death. And he said, warn my side of family that this is real, that I don't want them to come here. And on the way back, Jesus said, there's one more person I want you to see. And as they're going back, he hears a scream of a voice of a young man he knew, 16 years old, used to be his neighbor. And he had been found with his head decapitated because he had been in the occult. And he screamed and he said to him, warn the teenagers not to get in the occult because it's real. And he said that I was serving the devil and uh, my, they took my head off and I ended up here in hell. And he was burning and screaming and he was stuck between planks and burning. And the man, when he, the Lord brought him back to the altar, he was weeping and crying and saying, Oh, my God, I never knew hell was like that. And then I walked a little further with the Lord, and I was crying in the spirit. And I, and I was in the spirit, but there was no tears. And I saw a river flowing of fire and blood. And skeletons chained together with a big black chain. And the cries of the dead was echoing through the chambers of hell. And then you could hear the cries and the regrets and the moans and the screams of people wishing they'd listen to a preacher, wishing they'd listen to somebody, a woman, a man, a child, to tell them to repent of their sin. walked me over to the river and said, look. And in the air, in the flames, was big black letters out of the book of Romans. And it said, lovers of their own flesh more than God's command. Men loving men. Women loving women. With no fear of God. It was the word of God written in the fire. And I looked and I said, Jesus. And I heard a man's voice scream, why wasn't I warned? Why didn't somebody tell me? in hell where we went uh, to the belly of hell and all other kind of activities going on. There was other demons digging holes to bring more souls. There was fires, great fires, all through this and the screams of the dead. But there was one man's voice that was louder and his voice was so loud and screaming so hard. And Christ said, child, I want to show you something. I want to show you what it really means to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And this man blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I said, oh, my Lord. 
And so he took me over and he would elevate me up in the air, guys, and there was this coffin. It was open at the top. It was old wooden coffin, old timey coffin. And there was a skeleton on his back with real blood on his hands. And you were talking about the demons. They were 12 of them marching around the coffin with little slats with spears. Because people in hell feel like they have a real body. They feel like that they're, they're in their own flesh. And he was stabbing this coffin in there with the man inside, and he would scream and torment. And they do that 24 hours a day all the time. And he screams to get out, and he can't. And Christ appeared, and he saw him, and he said, Jesus, he called him, Jesus, get me out of here. I'll repent now to you. I'll never do those things again. Let me out of here. I've been here for years suffering. I relive everything I ever did. And the Lord said, Peace be still. And the Lord began to cry over this soul. And as I looked at him, I said, Lord, what did he do to deserve this? He said, He used to be a preacher of my word. He used to have a fine car, a beautiful home, a fine church. But Satan tempted him to steal from the church offering, and he did. Then he tempted him a, a year later to do something else in the church wrong, and he did. And he had the Holy Spirit. And he said the Holy Spirit began to talk to him and tell him, don't do these things, but he wouldn't listen. And as time went on, his heart was hardened. And he used to preach the true gospel, and he began to compromise my word. And see, Jesus said, this man had tasted my gifts, he'd healed the sick, he'd done many great things in my name, he had preached the word in my name, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit departed from him because of the devil entering into his heart, and the, he, he allowed it. And the day come when the Holy Ghost left him, that the devil entered in his heart, and he began to change. And, and you know, as I, I am telling this, I'm thinking about many ministers going to be watching this. And they need to repent. If they're out there, they need to repent. Because that blood will set you free. Don't stay hard in your heart. And I watched as Jesus said, I came to him myself. I manifest myself to him. And he wouldn't listen. I sent prophets. I sent apostles. I sent, uh, for months and years, I tried to change him. But the day come, he wanted to open up a seminar in town against the Holy Ghost. Teach against him. Knowing better. He knew better. And he said what happened, he was killed in a car wreck when he left the church. And this is where he is. And he said there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. And we just left there crying. I did too. As Christ and I went on our journey night after night, what I learned, he talked about his blood in hell. That if they had received him, no matter what they did, he would have washed them clean by his power and his blood. Because when he was crucified, that's why he did that, to save us from eternal damnation. If we would believe he was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then I learned something. As I'm walking with him and talking with him, I learned out of the book of Galatians. There's 17 works of our flesh. He took and he showed me a valley full of murderers. They had died on the earth. They were, their main thing they did in their life was to murder people. They had to be millions. And I began to look at a vast number. They were skeletons chained together. And they were burning and screaming. And then he said, I want to show you people that have hate in their heart. He showed me a valley without number. And these were also uh, chained together, burning and screaming. And demons walking through torment them. And some of them were literally pulled apart and taken all over hell and they were screaming. Each part of the body would scream. And I thought, oh my God, what a torment. 
And then um, he showed me, like, a people in the cult, like I told you, in, in the center of hell. He showed me the murderers. He showed me the haters. He showed me the ones that are prejudiced. This is a subject that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but God does not see color. Listen, love knows no color of our skin. And what you have to do is love you one another as Christ loved us. And we have to watch what we say because that brings roots of bitterness and hatefulness. And in hell, there was a section for people like that. There was a section in hell for the hypocrites. They were in the heart of hell. It was a heart of hell as big as a football field. And around the base of it was sewers from the earth that run around it. The stink was beyond your belief. And in the midst of this is rats. Rats big as uh, 70 pounds. They're real. They're not a spirit. And they bite on these souls. The torment of things you just don't understand because it's hidden from you. But as you look at this and as you listen, and you understand the knowledge has been hid from us, revelation knowledge. God wants us to see and know these things so we do not go to hell. God wants us to have a, a, a knowledge and wisdom of what's down in the middle of the earth. And when God begins to show somebody these things, it's earth shaking. On this journey in hell, I was one night walking with the Lord. And he said, I'm going to show you the fun center in hell. It's like a Roman theater, and the devil is setting up in his throne at the top of this big rock place. It was all rocks. And it's similar to a Roman theater where they used to torment the men, you know, and kill them, let the lions come out and eat them. Well, here was a Satan on his throne. He had a book out on a, on a big... Uh, he was in a chair, and the book was on a, like a throne, Okay. And there was names on that. And then the demons had went through hell and picked out certain people and had them lined up. All these skeletons, you know, and they were men and women, top of their voices, and they were crying. And the Lord said, this is horrible, but I want you to tell the people of the world about it. The devil would throw his head back and roar and laugh. And you could see him, he was solid looking. He had big horns, his face was red looking. He was very, very demonic looking. He looked kind of like the old movie, The Legend. Is what he looked like. Had the hoof feet and everything. And he's sitting up there and he's huge. He's so big. And they bring these uh, people before the throne. The first, I think it was a man. And all around the edges, there's these demons with spears and growling and laughing. And they brought this uh, person up front of the throne. And uh, he opens up this book and he said, Well, I see uh, when you were on the earth in uh, the beginning... You used to preach the gospel. That's what he called it, the gospel. And according to my report, you got many people to turn and their way stopped. He watched how he worded it, okay? He said, you got many people to turn from uh, darkness into light. That's what he said. And he said, I see here a list of the Things you did, so what we did, the devil looked at him and said, we sent out a crew of demons to stop you. said, we sent them out to come and to stop your works because you were doing too much uh, in the light. That's how he would word it. And he said, uh, we deceived you, and then I set a trap for you and killed you when you were in deep sin, and that's why you're in hell. That's what he told him. He said, I didn't give you a chance to repent said, God, he did say this, he said, God has grace and mercy, why do not? He said, I have no mercy. And he said, all those that were in line with you, I did the same to them. They used to be believers on the earth. And I thought about it, and I looked at the Lord, I said, Lord, he is truly a deceiver and a master, art a master. He said, yes, child, it says all through the book, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy and he deceived these people that you see in line. And right at their vulnerable state, he killed them. Because they, they uh, were in traps. They were in cages. Ensnarled by him, I should say. Ensnarled by him. And the devil began to laugh. And he said, uh, tormentors, come and get him. Get her or him. What happened? She, this corpse was standing there. And they would each one would come and pull an arm off. Pull the head off. The legs off. 
and the tarsal they had. So they would take that body where they pulled it apart, and they would scream. Every piece of that body would scream for the other part. And they would take it all over hell and bury it, laughing. After all this is done, then they scream so loud, their screams are heard. And I don't know by who, but he said, God has mercy and sends power and puts them all back together again. Now that's horrible. That's horrible. And you think about what a, what a wicked, wicked devil is, and you better get mad at him. You better get really angry in the name of Jesus. You better stand up, fight for your family because he's real. It's an unseen force, and that's why I preach. That's why I pray, and that's why I travel. To tell people, you know, it, it, to wake up, you know, time is short. The demons in hell, they can take on many shapes, okay? You can see one like three inches high would uh, swirl around the skulls of people. Say, we deceived you, we deceived you. You could have had Jesus, but we deceived you. With the lust of your flesh, more than God's commandments. And they would curse and blaspheme God. Now, these in hell I seem like animal creatures, okay? It may have been an illusion, okay? Because they are illusions in hell. The devil brings illusions, a false paradise and everything. But I've seen these with corpses on the backs of them also, and burning and screaming. Even the horses was on fire. I was walking with the Lord on the valley of the shadow of death, and it was crawling in the muck beside me. It was huge, like a big bear. But I never saw its face. I just saw its backside. But I did see them in hell that looked like humongous bears. And I think they've taken on the forms of the animals, you know, to bring more torture to people and more... Uh, I really believe that as I'm even talking to you. I really believe that they have done this to bring heartache, more heartache to the people, like seeing a horse or a, a bear or something like that. Because they're all demons. They're devils. We go to the left arm of hell. And then the left arm of hell is a snake as big as a train, a locomotive. And it's real. It's not a spirit. And he said, look at this child. And when I did, this snake would send fire out of its mouth and would come like three feet from us and go back. And the head of this snake was big as a locomotive train. That's how big. He said, this snake will hit the earth when the world, the church is called away. That's exactly what he said. So I learned that all of these vicious creatures, heartless, have no mercy. They have no pity. The people that go to hell, they, they, they know they're doomed for the lake of fire. And they take out all their vengeance on one soul. A couple of times when God was, Jesus was showing me through the pits and the fires and the hypocrites and the heart of hell, and I went in there. I was so afraid. And a couple of times I didn't see the Lord. He allowed it. He allowed me to suffer in hell too. In the jaws of hell. And let me really feel like for a few minutes what it was like to be lost in hell. It's horrible. And with no relief or no help. And he did that because of the revelation of hell. Like John the Redder, revelator hell. And when you're chosen of the Lord to do certain things, He wants you to experience certain things. So when I was there with the Lord, I began to understand the living Word of God. And I also saw, I talk about in the book of Revelations, the beast, and in the book of Daniel, with the seven heads. I saw that beast in the, in the middle of hell roaming and, and growling. The neck of that beast was about maybe, I don't know, real, real long, I didn't have, it was maybe five feet each neck. And on their heads was a crown. And their teeth, they were real, there was not a spirit. Their teeth are like razor blades, they go backwards and forwards. And he said these are seven major kingdoms against the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he told me. He said, child, these are seven major doctrines that do not preach the truth of Jesus Christ in the whole earth and it comes out of hell and he told me uh, about the abyss he said there was demons and uh, evil powers down there so bad 
that if he was to release them, they would destroy the whole earth. That's how vicious they are. They're in chains and in jail cells. And they scream and growl and curse and do black things. And we have to think about this. A place called Outer Darkness. Uh, I could hear demons conversing. Jesus let me hear it, okay? He said that he wanted me to understand how we're attacked by demon powers. He said that, um, I want you to listen to what they're saying. There was groups of demons conversing and talking. And say you have an aunt, okay, say, that lives in Georgia. And she's saved and full of the Holy Spirit, loves God, and goes to church. And the blood covenant keeps her, her family, her loved ones, okay? But say she has a niece in New York City that is in the street, she's on drugs, and the aunt's always praying for her. So these demons will send attacks to this child that, that she don't understand about the blood, she don't understand about the covenant, and cause her great grief. Or they will go to a, a church where the power of God is moving, there's young people come in that mock the Lord, and they will speak to them sitting in the churches, and they will cause great commotion, even on the, outside the church. They do this to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord told me. He said, where he has a band of angels that fight for the truth, there's groups of demons that go up to stop the gospel. And from people believing, like, for instance, they were talking about going to this person uh, that didn't have any faith, and didn't believe in, caused chaos, you know, like, uh, fires or, or all kind of stuff. And what saves us from that is loving the Lord, having faith in God, and believing it. I'm just telling you some of the strategies that they use. Uh, even in one of the wars that broke out, I mean, it's coming to me, one many years ago, uh, there was angels actually appeared to these men, the leaders, about the war and told them not to have that war. Angels came and told them, and they still had the war. So we don't know, you know, we don't know. And But we have to trust the Lord is the main thing, and faith in God, and be born again. But even when you're saved, we get attacks. It's a battle, we call it, okay? But how to protect ourselves from these things, they must be born again, okay? Must have Christ in their heart, because they were always talking about going to... A uh, relative that's far away that don't even know about Jesus, you know, and things like that. I did hear that. Yeah, and that's why it's important for us Christians to pray for our relatives, our bloodline, our generations. Now, when I was down there, I saw a vat of fire, huge vat of fire with liquid boiling hot lava and God's eternal judgment. And I saw demons laughing and dragging souls over. It just died from, from the earth that it was called the abominables. And they're thrown in this liquid fire. To burn forever and ever and ever. The people really need to know this. They need to know that there is no coming out of that place. And they need to know that on the day of judgment in the book of Revelations, God shall speak and death and hell shall come up in the universe. They don't go into heaven. That's in Revelations chapter 20. And there, when the books of life are open, those people in hell, their books were never washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that's what it's all about. We have a book of our life in heaven. That right now, if you're not born again and you're not saved, what happens? They keep recording your bad deeds. You just know that. But when you get born again on the earth and that blood washes you clean, that record's taken to heaven by angels. And then it's recorded in, in your book. But all these old things here, angels blot out all your sins and all your old transgressions. It's a Bible said, I even, he, I, even I am he that blotteth out all your old transgressions. 
And then these pages become crimson red. And then they take your book, and they record in your book. The minute you got saved, the sermon you heard, they record everything that God did. And they close the book up, and they take this before the book of the throne of God. saw the purpose for man's existence. But really, none of them had adequate answers. Now, if the evolutionary theory is true, then the question of the purpose of life is mute. For there is no purpose for life. If I exist only by the most incredible series of accidental circumstances. I am here by accident. There is no reason, there is no purpose for my existence. And that opens the door to all kinds of serious consequences. If my life has no meaning or no purpose. If I am only going to spend this short span here on earth and then I pass into oblivion, if there is no God who created me with a plan and a purpose, if there is just the survival of the fittest, this leads to all kinds of extremes. It was this concept that allowed Hitler to seek to exterminate so many people that he considered inferior as he was seeking to create the great super race of Aryans. And he could justify the horrible genocides because they were creating a super race. It gives the rationale to the parents when they discover that they are expecting a child to have a sonogram made to discover the sex of the child. And if they desire a girl and they find out that the child is a boy, then abort it. Because at there's absolutely no purpose for existence anyhow. So it gives rise to this whole thinking concerning abortion that we can get rid of a child that we are not interested in or we don't want. And we can do it with impunity because we don't see that there's any real purpose for existence anyhow. It gives a rationale to getting rid of anyone who stands in your way. It is the survival of the fittest. And the fact that you can get rid of them only proves that they were weaker than you. And thus you're justified in getting rid of them. It leads to statements like those made by John Price who is a prominent proponent of the New Age movement. He wrote a book called Practical Spirituality. He was guided, according to his own statements, by a spirit guide, a man of great ancient wisdom named Asher. And in this book, they propose that when the Aquarian civilization comes into place, all may join it. But those narrow ones who take Jesus at his word, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me, will need to experience a cleansing. And by that they mean extermination. 
His spirit guide Asher in 1985 suggested that those individuals with lower vibratory rates will be removed in the next two decades. Price answered his guide, I know that overpopulation is one of the greatest problems we face, but wiping out two billion people from the face of the earth is a little drastic, don't you think? The spirit guide ends, Asher responded, who can say but th that these people volunteered to be a part of the destruction? You see, they can talk in terms of exterminating two billion people. Because there's really no purpose for existence anyhow. And if these people are so narrow and bigoted that they can't join the world community, then it's best that they be expunged to get rid of those who might hinder the development of the new age. If there is no God, then there is no real purpose for life. And all of these issues can be justified. The fittest will survive to make the next evolutionary change and achieve into their own godhood state. But the Bible teaches that there is a purpose for our existence. The Bible teaches that you were created by God and that he had a plan for your life when he created you. God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1, and he said, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. Before you ever existed, God said, I knew you. And I ordained, I had a purpose, I had a plan for your life. In Psalm 75, verse 66, the psalmist said, I have trusted in you from my birth. You brought me forth from my mother's womb, and I will ever praise you. I've been created by God. I have been created for the purposes of that God has for me. Isaiah said, Listen to me, all nations. Hearken, you people from far. The Lord has called me from the womb. While I was being formed in my mother's womb, he made mention of my name. And he goes on to tell about the ministry that God had ordained him to accomplish. The Lord said concerning Paul the Apostle, He is a chosen vessel unto me. When Paul was on his way to Damascus, you remember the story, he was apprehended by the Lord, and his life was turned 180 degrees, completely around, going now the opposite direction. He was heading out to Damascus to imprison the Christians. He ended up in Damascus being a Christian as a result of the encounter on the road. But as a result of that encounter, he was blinded. And so the Lord spoke to a disciple in Damascus named Ananias and told him to go to the street called Straight and inquire for a man by the name of Saul. He said, because he's praying. Ananias said, Lord, Saul, you must be kidding. I know this fellow. I know him. He has wrecked havoc to the church in Jerusalem. And he's come here to Damascus to imprison those that call upon your name. The Lord said, he is a chosen vessel unto me. I will show him the things that he must suffer for my sake. In other words, God is saying, I've chosen him. I have a purpose and a plan for his life. And later, Paul, referring to that, said that he was separated from his mother's womb for the purposes of God. God had been working in his life, though he didn't know it. Long before he ever met Jesus Christ, God had a plan and a purpose for him 
and he came to realize that in time. Writing to the Romans, Paul speaks of how we've been predestined according to the will of God, that we might be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. A part of God's purpose, that your life might be conformed into the image of Jesus. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, said that God is working in us as he prepares us for the good works that he has before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, Paul is saying, God has purposes for you. And he is working now in your life to prepare you to fulfill those purposes, to accomplish that work that God has already planned and purposed that you should accomplish for the kingdom. In our text here in Revelation, there in the heavenly scene, the cherubim are worshiping God, declaring the glory of his eternal nature. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, which is to come. And as they are thus worshiping the Lord, the 24 elders take their golden crowns, cast them on the glassy sea before the throne of God, as they declare, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your good pleasure they are and were created. Listen, philosophers, there is the answer to your question. Why am I here? What is the purpose of my existence? You have created all things, and for your good pleasure they are and were created. Created. How can we bring God pleasure and thus fulfill the purpose for our existence? In the book of Hebrews, we read concerning Enoch, how that he walked with God and he was not because God took him. But before God took him, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then the writer says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. To please God, you must believe in God. And you must believe that God will reward you if you seek him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Paul wrote to the Romans and said, those that are living in the flesh cannot please God. God is not pleased when we live for ourselves, when we live for our own pleasure, when our chief purpose of life is to fulfill our own desires. That's not pleasing to God. But God is pleased when we submit our lives to obey Him. You remember when Jesus came to John to be baptized, John said, no, this is reversed. You ought to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, Allow it to be now, John, because it is important that I fulfill all righteousness. He came to do the will of the Father, he said. He said that he did not come uh, to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. And he said, I do always those things that please the Father. And so as... Jesus was baptized when he came up out of the water. The voice of God spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father is pleased. God is pleased when we yield ourselves in obedience to his will. 
Jesus, of course, was a classic example. Surrendering to the will of the Father and twice God attested his pleasure in his Son. If pleasing God is the purpose of my existence, that means that my life will never be truly fulfilled until I do please God. People today are looking for fulfillment in so many things that leave them at the end empty. They have a glitter, they have a shine, they have an attraction, and they make a promise of fulfillment. They make you believe that if you could only achieve this, if you could only have that, that you would then be completely fulfilled. And thus people are pursuing after various ambitions and goals and dreams, hoping that if they can just but achieve them, somehow the void within will be satisfied and they will be fulfilled and happy. Solomon, of course, is a classic example of these people. He talks about it in Ecclesiastes. He said that he thought he could find fulfillment in life through party. Life is just one big party. Give yourself over to just pleasure. Whatever comes into your heart and mind, go ahead and do it. Live for pleasure. But he said... I found that it brought emptiness and frustration. So then he gave himself over to wisdom. It lies in understanding, in knowledge. And so he became highly educated. But he said, with all of my wisdom and knowledge, there comes sorrow because I know so much. I have this sorrow and that too, he said, was emptiness. And so he gave himself over to great building projects. If I can just build some lasting monuments. And he built the glorious temple in Jerusalem. He built the cities uh, fortified of, of, of uh, Megiddo and of Hatsor and uh, several cities. And then he said, but that too was emptiness. It must lie in riches. And so he began to amass riches until he was the wealthiest man who had ever lived up to that point on the face of the earth. And he said, as he looked at his riches, he began to get worried about who's going to get them when I die. Maybe my son will be a fool and he'll go out and just wildly spend all of this money that I worked so hard to amass. And he said, I found that there was an emptiness also in the wealth. One by one, he tried different things. One by one, he found disappointment and emptiness when he achieved those things. Until he finally ended up saying, I hate life. Because it is so empty and unfulfilling. Jesus said to the woman of Samaria there at Jacob's well, if you drink of this water, referring to Jacob's well, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. It will be like a well of living water just springing up within you. 
The words of Jesus to her, drink of this water and you will thirst again. Those words ought to be inscribed above every dream that you have that you think will bring you fulfillment and satisfaction. If I could only complete with 25 words or less. If I only had complete with 25 words or less. What is it that you are thinking will bring you fulfillment, satisfaction, whatever it is? Achieve those goals. Fulfill those dreams. But you'll find that you're still thirsty. They gave great promises, but they couldn't come through and fulfill. Because they that live for the flesh cannot please God, and you were created for God's pleasure. And it is only as your life brings pleasure to God that you will ever know fulfillment, satisfaction. We have only one life. It will soon be passed. And only what we do for Jesus Christ is going to last. Everything else is like wood, hay, and stubble to be destroyed in the fiery judgment. Only what I've done for Christ can bring lasting fulfillment, lasting meaning and purpose. Like it or not, you were created for God's good pleasure. The elders responded, you have created all things, that includes you, and for your pleasure they are and were created. You say, I don't like that, I don't think that's fair. I'm going to live for my own pleasure. Well, you can seek to do that. You can chase the end of the rainbow. But you'll always find that it's just a little further away. You never can really grasp it. You'll always need just one more. And it tempts, it holds out that promise, but there's no fulfillment in it. You can fight that concept, but I guarantee when you come to your final breath like Solomon, you'll be cursing life. You'll be hating life. You will look back on your life and say, it was all empty. Like Job, you'll say, Cursed was the day when I was born. Let it not be blessed. You'll be cynical. You'll be bitter. And you'll be empty at the end of the road. On the other hand, if you will live your life to please the Lord, you'll find that your life will become very rich very meaningful, very fulfilling. Each day will give new opportunities to see the work of God and the hand of God and your life will be so rich and so blessed. Looking back over the past week and sort of taking inventory, how much of the this past week, did you spend seeking your own pleasure? Seeking to please yourself? How much of this last week did you spend seeking to please God? What, you have, what have you done lately to please the Lord? Paul, writing to the Philippians, said, God works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Because you were created for that. You need to let God work in you 
work in your heart and in your mind those things that would please him and he will then give you the capacity to do them and your life will be rich your life will be full satisfying and like David you can say my cup overfloweth a rich life an overflowing life when you live your life to please him you fulfill the purpose for your existence and life is rich so we pray father we recognize the truth of this declaration we were created by you for your good pleasure and so, Lord, help us that we might seek to bring you pleasure. May that be the top issue in our mind, to please God. May that be the standard and the measure by which our lives are guided. Not by, is it right or wrong, but is it pleasing unto you? Help us, Lord, to grasp this concept. And help us, Lord, to live for your pleasure. Knowing that in pleasing you, we're pleased. And our life becomes meaningful. Lord, for those that have been searching as did Solomon through various experiences and various fields of endeavor. They've been searching for satisfaction and fulfillment. But like Solomon, feel the emptiness of life. May they come to know the fulfillment in life by pleasing. Pleasing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Just, uh, you know, just as a little example. Uh, looking over this past week, how much time did you spend in front of the television? And what was the purpose of your watching television? Did you say, well, I'm going to please God for a few hours this evening. I'm going to sit down and watch this movie. Now, you know, in all of the time that was spent, do you really feel, feel that, my, this was very fulfilling? I, I, I just really had a wonderful week of fulfillment. Watch the World Wrestling Federation. And, oh, what a fulfilling evening. See those guys battering each other. Oh, that was so rich. My. You know, just for a moment, think of how much further you'd be down the spiritual road had you spent that same time in the Word of God and fellowshipping with Him how much richer your life would be, how much fuller. Does that tell you something? They that are in the flesh cannot please God. God is pleased when we submit our lives to follow him and to serve him. But then he promises that when we do, there will be rich blessings. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I would encourage you this week, diligently seek the Lord. The pastors are down here in the front. Maybe you've come up against that wall and you're feeling that emptiness today of life. Things have sort of fallen apart. Maybe some dreams have been shattered this week. 
and you feel so empty, come on down and they'll be glad to pray with you and get you started on the right path. The life of fulfillment, the life of meaning, the life following Jesus Christ. They're here to pray for you, so come on down and let them minister to you as we are dismissed. Uh, there was a lot of sexual... promiscuity. And it always follows when you have sort of a free sex kind of a, a society that you have unwanted pregnancies. And so this causing their children to pass through the fire is a reference to their practice of abortion. Though they didn't have the medical knowledge of aborting within the womb, once the child was born, they would take and cast it into the fires unto the god Molech or Baal, the god of pleasure, god of power, and, and they would get rid of the child after it was born. Today, if you go to the history of natural uh, the natural history of, uh, museum in Israel, you'll see many of their little iron representations of their god Baal. And when you see these little iron gods, you'll notice that the arms are outstretched, the hands are upward, and what they would do is put these iron gods in the fire, heat them until they were glowing red, and then they would take their little babies and place them in the outstretched arm of Baal as a sacrifice to Baal. You say, oh, that's horrible, that, that's repulsive. Well, we have the same situation in the United States today, the heightened sexual uh, arousals through pornography and all that is so available. We have uh, the promiscuous sex and we have the unwanted pregnancies. And thus far, about 35 million babies have been aborted in the womb as the result of this. God brought his judgment upon Israel for this very sin. And don't think that the United States is going to escape the judgment of God. It isn't. In Deuteronomy 32, God said, They've moved me to jealousy with their worship of these false gods. They've provoked me to anger with their vanities. I will move them to jealousy with those that are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in my and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, they'll be devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beast upon them with the poison of the serpents of the dust. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man, the virgin, the nursing child, and the men of gray hair. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And she has changed my judgments into wickedness more than the other nations and my statutes more than the other countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgment and my statutes. They've not walked in them. Therefore, Thus saith the Lord God, because you have multiplied more than the nations that are round about you, and you have not walked in my statutes, neither have you kept my judgments, neither have you done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee. I will execute judgments in the midst of thee, 
in the sight of the nations. I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto will not do any more the like, because of all of your abominations. Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter to the winds. God's judgment upon the nation of Israel, and it was literally fulfilled, the cannibalism that took place in Jerusalem as the result of the tremendous hunger uh, after the siege of Titus. You can read about it in Josephus, the wars, and the antiquities of the Jews, and it was a horrible thing. God has judged in the past, and the world is again ripe for judgment. God has promised that his judgment is going to come in the last days. There will be a period of three and a half years in which the world will see a greater judgment of God upon the whole earth than at any time in the history of man. This three and a half year period is known in the scripture by various names. It's called the Great Tribulation. It is called the Day of His Wrath. It is called the Wrath of the Lamb. It is called His Indignation. It's called the Hour of Temptation, the Time of Jacob's Trouble, and the day of the Lord's vengeance. Now the majority of the book of Revelation is devoted to describing in detail the judgments of God that are going to come upon the earth. As soon as we get to chapter 6, when the Lord begins to open the seven seals of, that are sealing the scroll, we will enter into this period of judgment, and it will be detailed for us on through chapter 18. And thus, as we study the book of Revelation, for the most part, we're going to be studying the judgment of God, the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon this world, and I believe in just a short time. God's judgments will be more severe than they were at any time in the history of man more severe than the flood, more severe than Sodom and Gomorrah, more severe than on the nation of Israel. Daniel said, in that, in that day shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. Jesus said concerning this time, Matthew 24, 21, For there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. This will be the greatest period of judgment that the world has ever or will ever see. Micah declared, And I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. But God has promised to spare his people when this day of wrath and judgment comes. In Daniel chapter 12 again, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Speaking of this day of God's indignation, Isaiah said, Come, my people, enter into your chambers, shut the doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is over. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her, sl her slain. The prophet Zephaniah said, Seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The prophet Malachi spoke and said, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. 
in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his only son that serves him. When Jesus was talking about the events of the great tribulation, he said to his disciples, Now take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts would be overcharged with surfeiting and with drunkenness and with the cares of this life so that that day will take you unaware or catch you by surprise. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass upon the earth. That is the things of the great tribulation and to stand before the Son of Man. When we get to chapter 5, we'll show you what that means to be standing before the Son of Man when the great tribulation takes place upon the earth. Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica said, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. In the text this morning here in Revelation 3.10, the promise of Jesus to the church of Philadelphia, because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which is coming to try men who dwell upon the earth. It's important that in our minds we clarify the difference between the tribulation that the church will go through and the great tribulation that the wicked will be exposed to. Jesus said to his church, in this world you will have tribulation. But the source of the tribulation of the church is Satan. He is the one that brings tribulation upon the saints. Upon those who are followers of Jesus Christ. The tribulation that we experience has many forms. Sometimes ridicule, sometimes scorn, mockery. When people say, you don't really believe that stuff about the Bible, do you? Oh, come on. You know, we've advanced in intellectually far beyond that. And, and they put you down and they scorn your faith in Jesus Christ. Not only that, the church has suffered physical persecution from the enemies of Jesus Christ. The history of the church is replete with men and women who have given their lives because of their faith and testimony in Jesus Christ as the wicked world around them, those that hate God and hate Christ, take out their hatred by seeking to destroy those who do believe. It is estimated that in the years between uh, three, well, actually the years between uh, about 60 and uh, the year 312, there were some 5 million Christians that gave their lives for their testimony of Jesus Christ. But it's going on to the present day. In the past year, there have been many people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Ministers were recently put to death in Iran because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And most recently, of course, they're in Littleton, Colorado, when this young girl bravely stood up and confessed her faith in Christ and then was... Uh, killed by those young men who had invaded the school because of her testimony and faith in Jesus. Tribulation, yes. But what's behind the tribulation? Satan. Now, when we talk about the great tribulation, we're talking about something that's entirely different because the, the source of the great tribulation is God. It is His wrath. It is his fury, it is his judgment that he's going to bring upon the earth. And it is for the wicked who will be punished. Isaiah 26, 
For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Micah 5.15, And I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. In Malachi 4.1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all of the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be the stubble. So, when God brings his judgment, the righteous will not be here. You remember the principle that was established when the angels were on their way to destroy the city of Sodom. They stopped by and visited with Abraham. And they said, shall we reveal to Abraham what we're doing? And they said, well, let's do. And so they said, we have been dispatched to destroy the city of Sodom because the iniquity, the sin of Sodom has come before God. And so we're on our way to destroy it. Abraham, knowing that his nephew Lot was living in the city of Sodom, said, well, shouldn't the Lord over the whole earth be fair? What if there are 50 righteous men in the city of Sodom? Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And they said, if we can find 50 righteous men, we'll spare the city. And Abraham began to negotiate until he got down to 10 men. And they finally said, if there are 10 righteous, we'll destroy the city. But what happened? When they came to the city of Sodom, they found there was only one righteous man. And he, it says, was vexed by the way the people were living around him. His righteous spirit was vexed. Do you find your righteous spirit vexed when you see the way people are living today? When you see the pictures of the Father's Day gay right parade in San Francisco, does that vex your righteous spirit? When you watch television and the news programs and the th things that are going on, the evil that is being promoted and existing, does that vex your righteous spirit? Then you know what Lot was feeling like. And when the angels came to Sodom and found only Lot, they said, get out of here. Quickly, because we can't do anything until you are out. And as soon as Lot was out of the city, God rained his judgment upon the city. And Peter, when he makes a commentary on that particular event, said, For God knows how to deliver the righteous, but to reserve the ungodly for the day of judgment. Now Jesus said, Pray ye always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Be careful, he said, lest your life become so involved in just eating, drinking, and the cares of this life that that day will catch you unprepared. For as a snare, it shall come upon all who dwell upon the earth. Warnings by Jesus. And of course, in Matthew's gospel, many parables. And with each one, the warning was, watch and be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. What if the Lord comes and you're not ready? You've been so caught up with the worldly things. 
that you're not really ready for his return. Does that mean that you have to be forever lost? As we move through the book of Revelation, we'll find answers to that question. For in heaven we will one day see a number of people who were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ during this period of the Great Tribulation. We will read of those who refuse to take the mark of the beast. This mark that will be given to every man and no one will be able to buy or sell unless they have this mark in the right hand or in their forehead. We'll get that in chapter 13 as we move through. And he has power to put to death anyone who refuses to take that mark. There will be many who will be saved, but that will be a hard way to go. How much better to be ready when the Lord comes. How much better to be watching and to be ready so that we are taken with the church before the great tribulation period. As we go through Revelation, we'll be dealing a lot with this subject, but it is of extreme importance to each of us because really, you don't want to be here when God's judgment begins to fall. And the beautiful thing is, you don't have to be here. God has provided a way of escape. Father, we thank you for your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, a map of the future. Lord, may we live according to the instructions and the exhortations of your word. And Lord, help us to take heed, lest at any time we be so involved in just the worldly things that that day will catch us unprepared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we stand. The end of October, you'll see here at South Coast Plaza and the other malls, They'll be stringing the Christmas tree lights, putting out the reindeer and the Santa Clauses. And when you see that happening towards the end of October, you, you'll know that Thanksgiving is getting close. Because we know that Thanksgiving precedes Christmas. And though they are putting out the signs of Christmas, it only means that Thanksgiving is near. Now the signs of the coming of Jesus Christ are all signs of the second coming, the prophecies. They all relate to the second coming of Jesus. And as we see these signs, that tell of the second coming, you know the rapture of the church is getting close because we know that it precedes. And Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. Surely we are living in those times that Jesus was speaking about when there is distress and perplexity of nations. The literal in the Greek is, there is distress of nations with no way out. And look at the problems of the world today, the nations today. It seems like we, we've gotten ourselves in a real mess and there doesn't seem to be any way out. Signs of his coming. Look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draws nigh. But the big question is, are you ready? That's the issue. Jesus said, Pray ye always 
that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things that are coming to pass upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Are you ready? If you're not sure, the pastors are down here in the front to pray for you as soon as we're dismissed, we encourage you, don't head for the exits. Come on down to the front. They're here to pray for you that you might have the assurance and the knowledge that should the Lord meet you on your way home from church today, you'll be ready to meet the Lord. The prophet Amos said, prepare to meet thy God. Preparation is necessary. You don't want to just meet him cold. You want to make sure that you're prepared. So I'd encourage you to come on down. They're here to pray for you, to help you to be ready for the Lord. We've come to the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. This morning, we'd like you to look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. John sees in the hand of him who is sitting upon the throne a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. And he is referring to that scroll here in verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne the scroll that was written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? This question of who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals is referring, of course, to this scroll that is in the right hand of the Father. And the question is, who is worthy to take this scroll? Now, what is the significance of the scroll that someone is needed to be found worthy to open it? And why is it when no one in heaven or earth or under the earth is worthy, does John break forth into convulsive sobs? Because no one seems worthy to take this scroll and loose the seals. It is my opinion and the opinion of many other Bible scholars that this scroll is the title deed to the earth. You see, the earth originally belonged to the Lord by right of creation. The psalmist said, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all of them that dwell therein. But when God made Adam and placed Adam here on the earth, God gave to Adam the earth. It was sort of a gift of God to man that he might enjoy the beauty of the earth, the glory of God's creation, the wonderful things that are here on this planet, to take care of it, to dress the garden and to uh, enjoy God's beautiful creation. In Genesis 1.26, when God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have the dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle and every moving thing, and over all the earth and everything that creeps upon the earth. Let man have it dominion over all the earth. And so it was given by God to man, a wonderful gift to take care of and to enjoy. But when Adam and Eve disobeyed the command of God and they ate of the tree of, that was in the midst of the garden, 
Their action was actually a double action. One, it was disobedience to the commandment of God. But number two, it was obedience to the suggestion of Satan. So it was actually a double action. Disobedience to God, obedience to Satan. And in so doing, they actually turned the control of the earth over to Satan. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, said, Know ye not that whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Adam and Eve became the servants or slaves of Satan, slaves to their flesh. Now, if you yield yourself to obey the lust and the desires of your flesh, you will become a slave to your flesh. If you will yield yourself to obey the impulses of the spirit and the commands of the spirit, then you will become slaves to the spirit. It, it will be one or the other. You will either be living after the flesh and serving the flesh, or you'll be living after the Spirit and serving the Spirit. Adam and Eve chose to live after the flesh, and thus they became slaves to their flesh, or in bondage to their flesh. But through their action, Satan gained the control over the earth. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil. One of the temptations was to take him to a high mountain and to show him all of the kingdoms of the earth. And Satan said unto him, All of these I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. For they are mine, and I can give them to whomever I please. Satan is bragging that the earth belongs to him. He can give it to whomever he pleases. And Jesus doesn't dispute him. Jesus doesn't say, oh, no, they don't belong. He, he recognized that Satan controls the earth that it is under his dominion and control. He recognized that. Satan was bragging over the fact that the earth belonged to him. Jesus twice calls him the prince of this world. Paul makes reference to him as the God of this world. That is, he is the God that this world worships. And of course, it is quite obvious as you look at the world scene today that Satan is in control. That unrighteousness seems to be the fair of the day coming out of Hollywood, the music, the, the films and so forth are quite obvious that man is being controlled by the lust of his flesh and by the powers of darkness rather than by Jesus Christ. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, said, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Paul recognizes that the powers that control the world today are of Satan. This is why it is so completely wrong to blame God for the tragedies and the calamities that happen in the world today. These tragedies are the result of man's rebellion against the authority of God. Surely God is not to blame for these things that are taking place uh, that are so tragic uh, and 
all within the world today, but actually they are things that are being controlled by Satan. But it's interesting, Satan is the spin master. And so we call hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes acts of God. Interesting, isn't it? Rather than recognizing that Satan is con in control of the world today, uh, we, whenever a tragedy takes place, we say, well, it was an act of God. No, it was an act of Satan. You say, well, does he control the winds? Well, you remember when Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee with the disciples and this great boisterous wind came up, the waves were rising high and the little ship was being threatened to uh, go under. And the disciples woke Jesus up. And what did he do? He rebuked the wind and the waves. And immediately there was a great calm. The word rebuked is the same word used when Jesus rebuked the evil spirits and commanded them to come out of a person. And so it would probably be more accurate for the insurance companies to call them acts of Satan rather than the acts of God. For Satan is a destroyer. Uh, in Revelation chapter 9, 11, as it speaks about all of these evil spirits that are going to be loosed out of the abuso during the great tribulation period, it said they have a king over them, which is the angel of the abuso, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek, his name is Apollyon. Now the Hebrew word Abaddon means destruction. And the Greek word Apollyon means the destroyer. Satan is a destroyer. He is out to destroy you and everyone else that he possibly can. Make no mistake. Satan is no friend of yours. But Jesus came in order to redeem the world back to God. Originally God's, he gave it to man. Man forfeited it to Satan. Now Jesus has come to redeem the world back to God. He said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Peter, writing of this redemption, said, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain manner of life, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was slain as a lamb without spot or without blemish. As we sang, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Notice that here in Revelation 5, as Jesus takes the scroll, they sing a new song declaring, Worthy is the Lamb to take the scroll and to loose the seals. For he was slain, and has redeemed us by his blood, out of every people, tongue, kindred, and nation. In the Old Testament, there were certain laws that applied to the redeeming of something that had been lost. It was laws that concern the redeeming of individuals. You see, in the time of the Old Testament, if you owed a debt and you were unable to pay it, the one to whom the debt was owed could bring you to court and they would order your, the sell of you as a slave. And the money that was received by selling you would be used to pay the debt that you owed. Say that you were sold into slavery. If you had a relative who 
felt sorry for you. They could come and they could redeem you. Pay the price that you owed. And you would be set free. They were called the Goel or the kinsman redeemer. But there were also the laws that dealt with the loss of property. If for financial reasons you had to sell, say, your field, then you had the right to buy the field back. And again, if you were unable to do so, then a kinsman redeemer, a family member could come along and they could pay and redeem the field for you so that it remains in the family. Now, if you sold a home that was within a walled city, you had one year to redeem it or a family member coming in to redeem it. And if it was not redeemed in that first year, then the property went into the hands of the new ownership forever, perpetually. They then had full control. This is why when the scroll, the title deed to the earth, is being held in the right hand and the time of redemption has come when the angel proclaims with a loud voice who is worthy to take this scroll and to loose the seals when no one is found worthy John begins to sob why? because it meant that the world would go on forever under the control and power of Satan and his destructive work and that thought was too great for John to accept. And he began to sob with the thought of the world continuing under Satan's authority and power. But one of the elders said to John, John, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to take the scroll and to loose the seals. This law of redemption had a very interesting illustration in the Old Testament in the book of Ruth. There was a couple who lived in Bethlehem whose name, names were Elimelech and Naomi. They had two sons, both of them rather sickly, but because of a prolonged drought in Bethlehem, they sold the field that they owned and they decided with their family to move over to Moab where there was more rain. When they came to Moab, the boys fell in love with Moabitish girls, married them. But before they could have children, they both died and also Elimelech died. So Naomi said to the two girls, girls, I'm going to move back to Bethlehem, to my family there. Uh, there's nothing but bitterness and memories here in Moab. And so the one daughter-in-law went back to her parents, and the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, said, I asked you, please don't ask me to leave you or to forsake you or to return from following after you, because wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. And God forbid if anything but death should separate us. So Ruth, her daughter-in-law, came back with Naomi to Bethlehem. And because of their poverty, it was necessary for them to get food some way and under the uh, law, there was the provision that you could go into the field of grain or into the uh, vineyards or whatever after the owner had gone through and harvested the crop. He would only be allowed to go through once, not the second time. 
anything that was remaining after the harvesters had gone through was free to the poor people of the land. They could move into the orchard or to the vineyard and they could then take that which was left after the first uh, harvest by the owner. And so Ruth went out, and they called it gleaning, to glean in the grain fields because it was the time of grain harvest. It just so happened she went to the field of a very wealthy man whose name was Boaz. And when he saw her in the field, he inquired of his servants, Who is that cute little gal? And they said, that's Ruth, the Moabitess. You remember Naomi's daughter-in-law. He said, tell her I want to see her. And so Ruth was called to Boaz and he said, I've heard of the kindness that you have shown to Naomi. I think that's wonderful. He said, I want you to stay in my field and, and follow after my reapers. And I've commanded the young men to treat you right. When they draw water, you may drink of it. And at lunchtime, you can come and dip your bread in their soups. And so Ruth thanked him and said, you know, who am I that you should take note of me and all. But anyhow, uh, he was quite interested. And so he then instructed his workers. Now, when you see Ruth behind you, just drop hands full on purpose for her. And if she happens to go over into the fields where you have not yet harvested, leave her alone, let her go. So when Ruth came home with a bushel of wheat, Naomi said, where in the world were you gleaning today? And Ruth said, well, it was in a field by the uh, a man by the name of Boaz. And he told me to stay in his fields. Naomi said, you obey that, sweetheart. <laughs> Don't let him catch you in any other field. God is good to us. He happens to be a brother of my husband, Elimelech. So at the appropriate time, Ruth said to Boaz, I would like you to fulfill the law of succession and redemption. Now, the law of succession was provided in case a man would marry a woman and die before he had any children. Rather than allow his name to die in Israel, his brother was to take that woman as his wife and the first child born would be named after the dead brother so that the name would be kept alive in Israel. Now the seed of Elimelech was cut off in, the, in as much as the two sons died before they could get married and uh, thus there was the danger of the loss of, of his name. And so... Uh, Boaz said, ooh, I like that, but there's a problem. I have another brother, and he is closer in birth to Elimelech than I am. He has the first right to redeem the field. So he said, you go back to Naomi. Let me see what I can do. So in the morning, Boaz was at the gate of the city where the judges gathered. And when his brother came through the gate, he said, Hey, brother, come over here. I want to talk to you. He said, You remember our brother Elimelech, who, when Naomi moved over to uh, Moab, they sold their field and they moved to Moab. Well, the time has come to redeem the field. And you have the first right of redemption. The brother said, Well, great, I'll take it. Boaz says, There's a hitch. Whoever takes the field will be required to have a child by Ruth in order to raise up the brother's name in Israel. 
And Boaz, his brother, said, Oh, Boaz, you know my wife would never stand for that. You're a single man. Why don't, why don't you redeem a Boaz? And Boaz said, All right. And so he redeemed the field and took Ruth as his bride. And they had a son, they named Obed, who had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David, the wonderful king of Israel. But the picture is that of redemption. The redeeming of the field, Boaz, not because he needed or wanted another field, but he was in love with Ruth. He wanted the bride. And so he purchased the field to get the bride. When you come over to the New Testament, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man going through a field and discovering a treasure. And who for the joy of the discovery of the treasure goes out and sells everything that he has in order that he might purchase the field so he can obtain the treasure. Now in parables, the field represents the world. So the question then is, who gave everything to purchase the world? And of course, the answer comes back. It was Jesus who gave his own life to redeem this world back to God. Why? Because God wanted another planet? No. He was in love with the treasure, which turns out to be the church of Jesus Christ. That he might take the treasure out of the field, out of the world. And so you have that beautiful picture in the Old Testament of redemption. And it gives you an idea of how that Jesus came to redeem us who were in slavery to sin. To redeem the world that have been forfeited to Satan. So we've been redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Worthy is the Lamb to take the scroll and loose the seals, for he was slain and has redeemed us by his blood. When John declares no man was found worthy to take the scroll or loose the seals, that tells us that no organization or government or man can redeem the world from the power of Satan. There's no political power that can bring redemption. The UN cannot save the world. There's only one who can save the world that is Jesus Christ. No one can redeem you. No one is worthy. You can't redeem yourself. Religion cannot save you. The keeping of the law cannot save you. Good works cannot save you. The golden rule cannot save you. As the hymn goes, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He only is able to redeem. John wept because no one was found worthy. But his sobs were mollified by the elder who said, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. Oh, thank God. Jesus paid the price to redeem you from your sin. And he paid the price to redeem the world from the powers of darkness. And it is only a matter of a short time until this redemption comes due. And Jesus will step forth in heaven, take the scroll, and begin to loose the seals. And in chapter 10, he comes back to the earth, setting one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the earth with the open scroll, declaring, 
that the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Messiah, laying claim to that which he purchased when he died on the cross for you and for me. Let's pray. Father, as we look at the picture and we see your glorious plan of redemption, how thankful we are that Jesus came as a man, that he might be a kinsman redeemer, and that he went to the cross and paid the price to redeem us from our sin and to redeem the world from the powers of darkness. Lord, today we receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We acknowledge the glorious salvation that he purchased for us at such a great cost. And we thank you, Lord, that as the result of this redemption, we have that glorious hope for the coming kingdom of God and the reign of the Lord over all the earth. Oh, Lord, may thy kingdom come and thy will be done here in earth, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front this morning to pray for you. If you are not certain that you have been redeemed. If you're not certain that you are a child of God, that when Jesus comes, he'll take you into the kingdom of God. If you don't have that assurance, if you don't know for certain that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, then I would encourage you to come forward and pray with the pastors this morning. If you do not know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven, that you're ready to meet God, now is the time to make your provision. Now is the time to accept that work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. We encourage you, come forward as soon as we're dismissed. They're here to pray for you, that you might know for sure that you're a child of God. John, writing to the believers, said, These things write we unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. You can know that. Make sure you. As we move through the Bible, we've come this Sunday to the seventh chapter of Revelation. This morning, we'd like to draw your attention to the 14th verse of Revelation chapter 7. As John sees in heaven this vast multitude of people that no man can number, who are obviously not the church. Because when the elder said to John, who are these? Where did they come from? John declared his ignorance and said, you tell me. And so the elder explained to John that these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Sin mars a person's life. It leaves an indelible stain. And there is only one thing that can wash away the stain and the guilt of sin 
and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Good works, all of your efforts cannot avail to wash away the guilt of sin. There's only one cure for the blight that sin leaves upon a person, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Bible, leprosy is used as a type of sin. Number one, because leprosy is incurable. And in Bible days, it was completely incurable. Today, through medicine, we can arrest uh, the uh, progress of leprosy. But it remains in the system, and a person has to remain on medication. But it is a type of sin because it is progressive. It grows. Leprosy, interestingly enough, progresses by rotting. And thus an interesting type of sin, the rottenness, gradually is destroying you. Leprosy is an interesting type of sin uh, because it is deadly and thus the Bible uses leprosy as a type of sin, incurable, deadly, progressive, it rots. But in the law, there is a very interesting statement in Leviticus chapter 14, verse 2, that says, this is the law of the leper in the day that he is cleansed. What does that mean? That means that God has made a provision for him to work in this deadly incurable disease where it is impossible for man to do anything about it, God has left an open door for him to work and to cleanse a man from his leprosy. Now it is interesting, you never hear of or read of leprosy being cured, but of being cleansed. And thus God made provision, should he in his grace and sovereign desire choose to heal a person from leprosy, there was a way by which that person could come back into society by going and showing himself to the priest, being examined, going into a uh, isolation chamber for seven days, being examined again, and then offering the sacrifices and being restored to the community. God made provisions. It is interesting that for fear of leprosy, they isolated the leper. He was ostracized from his home, his family, from the community. He had to live outside the city. And if anyone would approach him, he'd have to cry out, unclean, unclean. It's sort of sad that we don't have some kind of a rule like that for sinners today. that they'd have to cry out, unclean, unclean, you know, don't get near me, I'll pollute you. One day a rich young ruler came to Jesus seeking the way of salvation. And Jesus told him what he needed to do. And he went away sad because he wasn't willing to pay the price. And Jesus said to his disciples, it's so hard for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. Actually, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a man who trusts in riches to enter heaven. Peter said, Lord, if that's the case, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. Sin is incurable. But sin can be cleansed and God provided the way for the cleansing of sin. 
he made one provision whereby a person can be cleansed of sin and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world it is interesting that through the history of the Bible you have uh, the idea and concept of sin being covered by the sacrifice of an animal. It goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, ate of the tree in the midst of the garden, of which God said, when you do that, you'll surely die. But when they did that, and suddenly they had the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were open, and they realized they were naked, they sewed together fig leaves, to cover their nakedness. I think I would have probably chosen uh, maybe avocado leaves. Fig leaves are scratchy, but uh, anyhow, that was their choice. <laughs> but it is interesting that when the Lord accosted them with their sin, he gave to them, it said, coats of skins to cover their nakedness. Their sewing together fig leaves represented their own endeavor to cover their guilt. But God killed some animals to give them the fur coats from those animals to cover their nakedness. But the sacrifice, and thus the idea was developed and born of the necessity of an animal to be slain in order that the guilt of sin might be covered. So that when the sons of Adam and Eve brought their sacrifices to God, Cain brought the labor of his own hands. He brought some of his vegetables from his vegetable garden that he had cultivated and tilled. Whereas Abel brought a lamb for the sacrifice. And God accepted the sacrifice of Abel, but he rejected the sacrifice of Cain. As God rejects the works that we might do to try to cover our guilt, they just won't pass. But there has to be the death. Because the wages of sin is death. God said that they would surely die. And thus, the substitutionary death of the animal in order to cover their sin. When God tested the faith of Abraham by asking him to offer his only son Isaac as a sacrifice unto the Lord there on uh, the mountain that God would show Abraham, Abraham journeyed with the servants and with Isaac from Hebron for three days until they came to the area of Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. And there at the base of the mountain, Abraham left the servants and with Isaac they started up the hill. And Isaac said, Dad, haven't you forgotten something? Here is the wood and we have the fire but we don't have any lamb to sacrifice. And Abraham said, Son, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And thus this idea of offering a lamb for the sacrifice. Later on, when Moses came to the Pharaoh and demanded that the Pharaoh release the children of Israel from their slavery. And when he refused, God began to send plagues upon the Pharaoh. And finally, God said to Moses, I'm going to pass through the land and I'm going to kill the firstborn in every family throughout all of the land of Egypt. But in order that the children of Israel might be spared, 
have them go out to their flocks and take a lamb of the first year. Kill it. Put the water in a basin. And with hyssop, sprinkle it upon the lintels and the doorpost of their homes. And when I pass through the land this night, when I see the blood, I will pass over that house. And thus, the sacrificial lamb, the blood covering the door, spared them death of their firstborn. Later on in the law, as God established the sacrifices, the sin offerings, God established that a person could bring a lamb for his sin offering and the lamb could die in his place. These all were types that were looking forward to the coming of the Lamb of God into the world. There were prophecies in the scriptures concerning the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. We've already spoken of Abraham. How when Isaac said, Dad, we don't have a lamb for a sacrifice, he said, the Lord will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And later on, when Abraham was ready to offer Isaac and the Lord stayed him from doing so. He said, behold, there's a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And Abraham went over and took the ram and offered it as a sacrifice. And then he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And then he prophesied in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. It is interesting that it was on Mount Moriah that the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. The very same mount where Abraham was ready to offer Isaac, the very same mount where Abraham prophesied the Lord will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And then he said, this is Jehovah Jireh, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Isaiah prophesied concerning the Messiah that he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears is mute so he opens not his mouth. He prophesied that God would make his soul an offering for sin. When John the Baptist was preaching, when Jesus came, John cried, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so the prophecies that Jesus was indeed and would come and be indeed the sacrifice for the sins of man, he fulfilled when he died upon the cross. For Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John tells us that when the soldiers came to break the legs of the prisoners to hasten their death, that they broke the legs of the two uh, criminals that were crucified on either side of Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. And thus the prophecy was fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. But instead, the soldier took his spear and pierced the heart of Jesus, ran it through his side, through the heart. And we read, and there came forth blood and water. The blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. You say, well, what is so important about the shedding of blood? Why do they have to shed blood? Well, the penalty of sin is death. There in the garden of Eden, God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. In other words, God pronounced the death sentence upon sin. In the law it said, and the soul that sinneth shall surely die. Paul declared the wages of sin is death. 
The Bible tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. When the blood is shed, it speaks of the life being given. As the blood pours out, the life is pouring out. You see, the blood carries life to all parts of our body. It carries the oxygen for the cells to burn. It carries the nutrients to take care of the cells. And thus, it is the red river of life that flows through us. And when a person bleeds to death, and it, the, the profuse bleeding spoke of the death. It recognized the death, the blood flowing forth. And thus it speaks of God's penalty of death for sin being fulfilled. When Jesus was with his disciples at the Last Supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Declaring that the shedding of his blood was for the remission of man's sins. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Then in chapter 2.13 he said, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were one time far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews declares, But Christ being come a high priest of good things, by the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not one made with hands, that is to say, this building, and neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean will sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? As Peter wrote concerning Jesus, he said, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with silver and gold from your vain manner of living, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who, which was shed as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then Peter wrote, Who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. John wrote, If we will walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we can have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ God's Son cleanses a man from all sin. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, as John is describing Jesus, he said, Who is the faithful witness? He is the first begotten of the dead and the prince of kings of the earth. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins and his own blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. John describes his first view of Jesus in heaven. When the scroll, the title deed, is being held by the Father and the strong angel with a loud voice says, Who is worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals? When no one is found worthy, no man can redeem the world. Back to God. As John begins to sob because no one is found worthy, the elder said, John, don't sob. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. He's going to take the scroll and loose the seals. And John said, I turned and I saw there in the midst of the throne and of the cherubim and of the 24 elders, 
the lamb. He looked like a lamb that had been slaughtered. And he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And they offered then the incense unto the Lord. And they began to sing a new song. Worthy is the lamb to take the scroll and loose the seals. For he was slain and he has redeemed us by his blood. Here John sees this multitude in heaven. You can't number them. There's just a huge multitude. And John sees them there and wonders about them. The elder said, who are these? Where did they come from? John said, well, you tell me. And so he said, these are they who came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There is cleansing power in the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse a person from the stain of sin. All sins, no matter how horrible your sin may be, there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ to wash you and cleanse you from that sin. As we read in Isaiah, God said, come now, let's reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, you can be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, you may be as white as wool. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses a man from all sin. You see, your sin can only have, well, the results of your sin can be only one of two. The result of your sin can bring you eternal banishment from the presence of God. Or it can be washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those are the only two things. Either it will condemn you forever or it can be washed. That's why God said, come now, let's reason together. Why should you allow your sin to destroy you? Why should you go on doing those things that are only bringing pain and hurt and sorrow to yourself and to others? Why continue in that deadly practice that will alienate you from God? Let's reason together, saith the Lord. He's willing to wash and cleanse you of your sin. Why should you go on in it? Why should you continue? Either you accept the redemption that is offered to you by Jesus Christ, or you will die in your sin and you will face the judgment of God. John sees this multitude whose robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You know, there are a lot of people today who sort of scorn the gospel because they call it a bloody religion. And they claim that they're offended by the talk of the blood. And some churches, in order to accommodate these people and to be seeker-friendly, have actually taken out of their hymnals all of the songs that refer to the blood of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. There's nothing else that can avail for you. There is nothing else that can cleanse you from your sin. There's only one provision that God has made for the washing and the cleansing of the guilt of your sin, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. God has made no other way. Paul wrote, For we preach Christ crucified, 
to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. The Jews were stumbled by the cross of Jesus Christ because they were expecting their Messiah to set up his kingdom and to throw Rome out and to begin his earthly rule. And and his the cross, it was an offense. It was uh, a, a stumbling block to them. To the Greek, it was foolishness. The idea that one man's death could bring forgiveness and salvation to a multitude of people, uh, to the uh, Greeks that just seemed like so much foolishness. But Paul said, but unto those who are called both Jew and Greek, Jesus Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. To us who are saved thereby, it is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus, as the Lamb of God, shed his blood there on the cross. He gave his life in order to provide for us the washing and the cleansing, the removal of that stain of sin from our lives that we might be as white as snow, pure in the eyes of God, because Jesus paid it all. The debt of sin we owed. Sin had left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Father, how grateful we are for the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed us from all sin. Thank you, Father, for your glorious plan of redemption, sending your Son as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Lord, we thank you that unto us who have been saved, it is the joy, it is the blessing, it is the power of God to salvation. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and not leaving us just to die in our sins, helpless and hopeless. But thank you, Lord, for paying the price and washing us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we stand? There is another hymn that we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And that's really the question right now. Have your sins been washed? Or do you still carry the the burden of sin? Is it still leaving its stain upon your life? Today, God is offering you washing and cleansing. God is offering you the forgiveness of every sin you have ever committed. For the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. You can go out of here today with a clear conscience, a clean conscience. You can go out of here today without any stain of sin at all in your life. The pastors are down here in the front to pray for you. You know, that burden of sin can almost destroy you. That guilt complex can make a neurotic person out of you. But Jesus Christ is offering today the cleansing, the pardon. Come now, let's reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, you can be as white as snow. The offer that God is making is such a marvelous offer. It seems absolutely ludicrous that anyone would reject 
the offer that God is making to them of forgiveness, cleansing, and pardon from their guilt. But that's exactly what God is offering to you today. Don't go home until you first have come to the cross and received the pardon and the cleansing from your sins. May the Lord bless and watch over and keep you in his love as you walk in fellowship with him, all made possible through Jesus Christ. through the Bible, we've come to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 this week, as Jesus is addressing the churches. In chapters 2 and 3, he will address the seven churches of Asia, four of them in chapter 2, three of them in chapter 3. As he addresses the churches, we'll discover that he was speaking of the churches that existed at that time in Asia Minor and conditions that were existing in those churches. But we will also discover that these seven churches fit perfectly with the seven periods of church history and we'll be looking at church history in the messages to the seven churches. But then we will also discover that there is application of each of these messages to the churches today. And thus we'll look for the Lord to speak to us in the messages to the seven churches. And even as Jesus addressed the issues, he said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I pray that God will give to us an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church today. This morning, though, we'd like to draw your attention to the fourth verse of chapter 2, where the Lord is saying to the church, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because you have left your first love. Note that the Lord had a lot of good things to say about the church of Ephesus. He said, I know your works, your labor, your patience. These are all important things in the Christian life. It is important important that we be involved in working for our Lord, laboring for the kingdom of God, and waiting patiently for our Lord to come. Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica of how he thanked God when he remembered their work of faith, their labor of love, and the patience of the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So these are characteristics that should exist in the church. We should be working for our Lord. We should be laboring for the kingdom of God. And we should be waiting patiently for the Lord to come. Not only that, though, the church in Ephesus, Jesus said, could not bear those which were evil. One of the great weaknesses of the church today is the toleration of evil, the lack of purity within the church. We find so often the church taking a very lax attitude towards sexual immorality, toward fornication, people living together, toward homosexuality. This lackness, towards the things of the world has been a weakening effect upon the church and its message. Tragically, the world has invaded the church 
and in many quarters the church has embraced the worldliness that has invaded it. The church in Ephesus would not tolerate evil, and they even went a step further. They had the gift of discernment operating within the church. When men would come along and claim to be apostles, they found that they were liars, and they cast them out. They had enough good judgment to realize when people were making false spiritual claims and they did not support such people. I'm amazed at how gullible many people are today when they get letters from so-called evangelists or ministries begging for funds and how without really inspecting or checking them through are moved by the letters to send in their support for these supposed ministries which many do not even exist. When I am at the Target store and I see the people out in front with little buckets saying help the homeless, I don't contribute. When I go to the airport and I see these fellows with the backward collars and the ladies with their white gowns and holding out their little buckets and asking for help, I don't contribute because I don't know how legitimate they are. I have no opportunity to observe the fruit of their ministry. When I give, I want to know that it's going to go for the advertised purposes that it isn't just going to help someone live uh, a, a life of uh, high style without having to work, which many do. And I want to be careful how I invest the Lord's money. I want to make sure it's going for the causes that I can see fruit and the results of the giving. The church of Ephesus, when people came along making boasts and claims of spiritual authority and power, they tested them. They found out that they were liars and they would cast them out. The church of Ephesus, the Lord said, had borne, they had patience, and in the name of the Lord, they had labored without fainting. If you would look at the Church of Ephesus, from the outward appearances, you'd say, this is one great church. This church really functions smoothly. Look how busy everybody is fulfilling their various tasks within the church. What a marvelous bus ministry they have. What a marvelous visitation committee, committee they have. Everything seems to be working so well. And from the outward appearance, it would look like this church was one fine church. It was well organized. Everybody was doing their job. But it was missing a vital ingredient. Their first law. Back in chapter 1, as John sees the vision of Jesus, he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He's holding the seven stars in his right hand. It is significant that when Jesus begins the message to the church of Ephesus, here in verse 1, this saith he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Because we are told in chapter 1 that the seven stars are the ministers of the seven churches. And that the seven golden candlesticks represent the churches themselves. And we would note that Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks or in the midst of his church. Jesus said where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in their midst. 
And though they had many things going for them, the lack of this first love was so vital in importance that the Lord was threatening to move the candlestick out of its place or to remove his presence from the church. How important is our love, that first love? It's more important than all of our works. It's more important than all of our involvement. It is tragic, but so many churches have become so organized that they can function without the presence of the Lord. Jesus' complaint, you've left your first love. The bloom of first love is such a beautiful thing. It seems to give a special fragrance to your entire life. You don't want to eat. You don't want to sleep. You desire to savor every thought of that one that you love. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth of the supremacy of this love, more important than our works, more important than the gifts of the Spirit functioning or being in operation within a church. The most important thing is that that church has this deep, love, commitment to her Lord. Writing to the Corinthian church, Paul said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's a meaningless noise. Though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. All of the sacrifices I might make, all of the gifts I might possess, all of the work that I might do is invalid if I don't have this love. The church in Ephesus had a lot of good qualities. A lot of things going for it. But they were lacking in the most important thing of all, the love. Do you realize the importance that Jesus puts upon your loving him? Only the works that flow from a heart of love are accepted by him. He's not at all interested in the works that you might do out of a sense of obligation or responsibility. If you're here this morning and say, oh, got to go for mom's sake, you know, probably you would have been better off to have stayed home. The Lord doesn't want that. He's not interested in that, oh, I've got to do, you know, I've got to go to church again, you know. He, he's not interested in that at all. He wants your service to him to flow out of a heart of love, to be the overflow of love and the expression of your love for him. I've heard people complain about the things they were doing for the Lord. Oh, I've got to go do this or I've got to go visit. And, and it's, it's sad that a person is doing things because of a sense of duty rather than the fulfillment of love. I've heard them speak of heavy burdens that they were having to carry. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And if you discover that the burden that you're trying to carry is so heavy that you're being weighted down by it, you better take a second look at that burden. It probably isn't from him. It may be something that you've taken on yourself, not directed by the Lord. And that can be a heavy burden. 
Or it may be that it's a burden someone else has laid on you. I have people all the time trying to lay their burdens on me. I mean, they've messed up their life, and now fix it, Chuck, you know. Your problem. No, it's not my problem. It's your problem. Don't lay your burden on me. The Bible says, cast your cares on the Lord. He cares for you. But people try and make you feel responsible to get them out of the hole that they have dug for themselves. And that can be a heavy burden if you try and take it. To this church that was in danger of losing the presence of Jesus Christ because they had left the first love, Jesus said three things. Number one, remember. Remember, he said, from whence you have fallen. Remember that first love that you had for the Lord when you first discovered his love for you. When he first lifted that heavy guilt of sin off your life. When you first discovered that Jesus loved you so much he died for you and your heart was responding to that love. No sacrifice was too great to make for the Lord in those days. In fact, you didn't even consider it a sacrifice. Anything you could do for the Lord was just sheer joy. Remember the reckless abandonment of your life to Jesus because you loved him so much. I was talking the other day with the members of the Love Song group, and we were remembering those early days. When they first took the Lord and how that they were willing to travel anywhere just to sing for Jesus Christ. They had their old van and all they needed was a box of raisin and a pack of oats. They were hippies into nature foods and so forth and uh, just some trail mix and these guys could go forever. <laughs> and they were willing to go. Because of the love for the Lord was so great and the excitement and just doing something for Jesus was just uh, something that charged their hearts. God remembers the first love. Jesus remembers the first love. As we read in Jeremiah this morning, God's lament over Israel as he told the prophet to go and cry to the people in, his, in Jerusalem, saying to them, I remember the kindness of your youth, the love when we were first engaged, when you went after me even in the wilderness into this barren land that was not sown. The Lord is calling you to remember that first love. But then he said, repent. You know, it's interesting that this is the first word of the gospel. When John the Baptist began to preach, his message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew tells us in chapter 4 that when Jesus began his ministry, from that time he began to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first word of the gospel is repent. Now the Bible tells us that godly sorrow leads to repentance. And to be sorry is a sign of repentance. But there can be a sorrow that is not a godly sorrow. And that is not true repentance. To say, I'm sorry, and then to go right back out and do the same thing again does not show true repentance. 
for repentance is not just a sorrow, but it also involves a change. And someone has said it is being so sorry that you don't do it again, that you change. So often we have people say, well, I'm so sorry. And then they go right back out and do the same thing over again. This happens, unfortunately, in, in family relationships, husbands, wives. The wife gets fed up and she says, that's it. I'm not going to take any more, you know, get out. And so she boots him out of the house and then he, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, you know, I just messed up. I'm sorry. I did all that. And, and, and pleads and she brings him back in and then he goes right back into the old patterns. That isn't a true repentance. For repentance involves change. And the Lord is saying, repent, change. And then the third word was repeat. Go back and do your first works over. It has been discovered in observing human nature that if a person acts out a motion, he will get the corresponding emotion. That's why it's dangerous to act out the motions of hatred, aloofness, because you discover that you soon have the emotion of hatred and aloofness. Sometimes in marriage relationships, there, there are those game playing things where I act like I'm really upset. And then I find I am upset. But it works the other way too. When you act out the emotions of love, you soon get the corresponding emotion of love. One of the explanations why in Hollywood we see so many changes in partnerships after a actress and actor have been in a movie together in which they are acting out these great emotions of love for each other, they get the emotion of love and they you find them divorcing their partners and marrying the one they just co-starred with in this great love movie. Act out the motions, you'll get the corresponding emotions. Jesus is calling them to go back and do the first works. Act out the motions. Go back to those first works and the corresponding emotions will rise. Start reading the word again on a regular basis. Start singing songs to the Lord again like you used to do. Isn't it interesting how with that first love we were singing songs to Jesus, even making up songs of love to him. But now, the songs that you whistle, the songs that you sing, are so often just reflections of the rot of the world. Return to your first love. Go back and do the first works over. Start fellowshipping regularly with God's people again. You remember how you would go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, during the week, because you were so in love. Go back, the Lord said, do the first works over. And if you do, you'll find that your love for the Lord will be rekindled. Your heart will once again burn in passion for him and for the things of the Lord. If not, well, the Lord said he would come quickly and remove the candlestick from its place. Though you may have all of the works, 
Though you may be laboring and have discernment and things of this nature, the Lord is saying to the church of Ephesus, if you don't have this first love, I'm not sticking around. I'll move the candlestick out of its place. And it comes also to the individual life. You'll lose the sense of the presence of the Lord in your life. You'll find that your spiritual life will become arid and dry. First love, oh, it's a beautiful thing. We've all experienced it. That excitement, that warm, glowing feeling that you have all over because you're in love. The Lord says he misses that. And as God said to the nation of Israel, what did I do? Where did I go wrong? That you turned away from me. What evil did you find in me? The Lord is speaking to the church. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And to the church of Ephesus, the Lord was saying, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Could he be saying that to you this morning? Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are for your love for us, that it doesn't change, it doesn't wane through time. It doesn't grow cold, but your love for us is just as fervent as when we first discovered it. Lord, you haven't moved. We're the ones that have moved. And Lord, we repent. We're sorry for the estrangement for moving away from that place of love. Draw us again, Lord, by your Holy Spirit unto yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here in the front to minister to you and to pray for you. If the Lord has spoken to your heart today, spoken to you about your relationship with Him, if the love has sort of grown cold, and He's drawing you back to that first love and to that excitement of relationship with Him, I'd encourage you just come as soon as we're dismissed, the pastors will be down here in the front to pray for you. Return to your first love. Call of Jesus to your heart. I pray that you'll respond. And that you'll go forth loving the Lord as like never before. For the passage of Scripture the greatest commandment was thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, that is, no other loves above mine, or your love for me. Nothing can substitute Unfortunately, we've allowed things to substitute. And the Lord said, don't love the world nor the things that are in the world. And yet, how many of you have embraced a love for the worldly things and that it has exceeded your love for the Lord? And he's calling you back. Repent, he said. Remember what it used to be. Go back and do your first works over. You'll soon have that love again burning in your heart for the Lord and the things of the Lord. What a glorious privilege prayer is. But more than that, God has invited me to come. 
to bring my needs, my requests, my desires. God said to Jeremiah, Call unto me, I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things. To David, God said, Call